Australia, home to some unusual animals found nowhere else on Earth. Australia, moths and beetles. When you think of Australia, you think of unusual animals, right? Animals like the kangaroo, the platypus, and the koala. But did you ever wonder how it happens that those animals live only in Australia and nowhere else in the world? Well, there are a few reasons. Australia is a continent, a large mass of land, but it's surrounded by water, so it's also an island. Australia is an island continent. And that means that the animals that live there can't get off. And animals that don't live there can't get on. But Australia wasn't always set off from the rest of the world. Millions and millions and millions of years ago, about 150 million years ago, when dinosaurs were still around, Australia was connected to Africa. South America. Antarctica, India, and Australia fit in right about here. What was this huge continent called? It wasn't called anything because there weren't any people around. People weren't even invented yet. But today, scientists call it Gondwana land, an ancient continent. Gondwana land. About 150 million years ago, Gondwana land started to break up in pieces. The first piece of land to separate slowly drifted to the northeast and became the continent we know today as Africa. The next piece of land to split off was India. It drifted north until it collided with Asia. Many millions of years later, South America, Australia, and Antarctica went their separate ways. And the continents are still moving today at a rate of a few centimeters a year. Where will they be in another 50 million years? Wait and see. A giant flightless bird once roamed Gondwana land. As the continents drifted to different locations, animals all over the world were adapting to their new environments. This giant bird evolved into the three large birds that live on different continents today the emu of Australia, the rhea of South America, and the ostrich of Africa. 
even after the big split. All the continents, except Australia, remained connected to each other in some way for a time. So animals living everywhere but Australia were free to move from continent to continent. Meanwhile, Australian animals, isolated from the rest of the world, evolved in their own special ways. Springtime in Southeast Australia. Every year at this time, the original people of Australia, called Aborigines, came here searching for something very important to them. For centuries, tribes of Aborigines traveled hundreds of miles to meet at the foot of the Brindabella Mountains. Small groups of scouts would be sent ahead to search the mountaintops for something very small, furry, and hidden. Today I'm with my Australian friend, Michelle, and archaeologist Josephine Flood. We're retracing the Aborigines steps, hoping to find what they were looking for. They must like the cold weather. It's freezing up here. <laughs> it's one of the coldest bits of Australia. Really? Yes. Yeah. We're up at 6,000 feet now. <laughs> oh, my yeah. gosh. They should be right around here somewhere. Yeah. Whereabouts would we be looking for them? Well, I think anywhere in the crevices here. Um, they like the dry places and dark places where they can keep cool. Can't see any here. Why, why? No, I think it's because it, that's too open and exposed. You get rain in there and they don't want to get wet. So you've got to find the places where they're protected and they would keep dry. Mm -hmm. Sure they, they're around here. Yeah, I think I saw one flying. Mm -hmm. If we can find the right sort of crack, I think we'll see them. And of course, your eyes have to sort of get used to looking in these dark little spots. Do you want to no. Hey, Michelle, come here. What's that? <gasps> Thousands of them. Oh, fantastic. Well, this is the bogong moss, and it's brown. As you see, it's about an inch long. A mob like that, it's called a moss camp. Now, is that unusual um, to find that many? Yes, it is. This is a vintage year for, for moss. There's <laughs> an awful lot of them around this year. I can't, oh. Do they move? <laughs> like that? Do, they, do they move? No, somewhere? usually they sit quiet on the walls. And uh, it's like hibernation, but it's called Eastivation because it happens in the summertime. They just come up here for about four months to have a rest. And they Easter it every year? Yeah, every year they come up here and they sit there in the cracks unless somebody get something gets them and it could be birds uh, find them a tasty morsel or of course the aborigines used to come up here and feast on them each year do they have any nutritional value at all oh yes they're very very high in protein in fact insects have more protein than any other sorts of natural foods and in australia the witchy grubs are number one and burgong moths are number two i got one it is. i got one mm. Are they... Oh. <laughs> it's easy to see why they're so easily hidden, because they're, they're brown and they just so get up against the wall, you can't even see that's them. That's right, that's why they're so hard to find. Mm -hmm. um, they're quite small as well, but uh, of course you have to eat an awful lot of moss to get a good feed. <laughs> <laughs> Are you actually studying them? Um, yes, I, I'm an archaeologist and so I got into um, studying them because I was studying the Aborigines of this area. Mm. And they used to come each year to the mountains, in fact, in pursuit of the Bogon moth, because uh, each winter there wasn't a lot of food around here. But in spring, about October, the moths arrive, and the Aborigines would follow them up to the mountaintops here, mainly the men. Mm. Um, and they would hold ceremonies up on the summits, uh, initiation ceremonies and so on. There's some ceremonial grounds up there. And they would use the moths as a, a staple food. And they'd eat about a kilogram of them per day. That's about two pounds. Oh. Every meal would be moths. And, that, and they yes. can be sustained on moths. Yes. And in fact, there's um, uh, eyewitnesses in the last century talked about Aborigines coming up here in October looking very thin after the poor winter. <laughs> and uh, then they'd go back. And they'd, uh, after a month of feasting on moths, their skins would be absolutely shining. How long ago was this? Oh, it went on until about 150 years ago. 
and for thousands of years before that, we don't really know quite how long, but certainly for a thousand years and maybe longer. Have you ever heard me? Oh, yes, I've tried. Really? Yeah. Are, they very, are they good? Very good indeed, what, yes. What, you nice. must have a go. <laughs> no. <laughs> How do we collect the moths? Well, the traditional Aboriginal way is to scrape them with a, a stick. You scrape the bottom row and the others fall down and you hold your bag underneath and uh, they'll all Just fall like in. Okay, so I'm going to try this now, do yeah. I? Yeah. So hold the bag right underneath so they fall because they're sleepy, you see, and so... Oh, yuck! Okay, well, I'm not being very successful here. They seem to be falling all over the place. Okay, well, maybe try with your hand then. <laughs> yuck! Okay, I've got some. Oh, yuck! Yeah, that's plenty. Oh, well done. <laughs> Terrific. Yuck. Well done. Look at it. You having fun, Michelle? You're, you're <laughs> eating them, though. I, I, I won't eat them. You did your best. I did the dirty work. <laughs> you got them. If you I had known them. that to begin with, I would have got in there. <laughs> yeah. Not, I'll eat them. Good I'll, deal. I'll, I'll, I'll eat it. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll eat Love it. it. I'll eat one if you eat one. No, I went in and got him. I'll yeah. eat one if you eat one. Come on, deal. Come on. Come on. We came all this way. Come on. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Poor Not things. happy about being disturbed. Mm -hmm. Or being yeah. eaten for that matter. Oh, no. well. <laughs> well, these are only a very, very small number out of the millions that are still sitting there on the rocks. So. Mm -hmm. And they've only got a life expectancy of a year. So that's that's right. They so that yes, what happens is that if they didn't, if we weren't going to eat them, then. Um, They'd fly back again if they survived, because the birds are after them and everything else. But if they survive about March, they would fly back to the breeding grounds, and then um, they would breed, and then they die. And then the whole cycle starts again, except the thing that amazes me is that all the new moths that are born, they've never been here before, and yet they all fly up to the mountains. They know where to okay. go, although they've ne never been. How do you explain that? Well, I, I suppose it's instinct. It's, you know, something they've inherited you know, genetically. And um, these bogong moths also exist in New Zealand, but there they don't migrate. I think because it's colder there, whereas in Australia, what, why they migrate seems to be because it gets too hot for them in the breeding grounds, which are out in the flat plains. And so then they come up here to the mountains each year because they come up at the beginning of summer. Okay, we're ready? Yep. yep. Okay. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, some of them will fly away, but others <gasps> oh, will uh, stay there. Oh, goodness. Right, hold them down. <laughs> and then pick them out later? Yes, a couple of minutes, about a minute on each side is what you give them. That's right. the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you uh, pick them out, and then comes the moment of truth. <laughs> <laughs> you? Okay. Uh, now, I'll you be sure game. they're really cooked? Cool. I'm going to just rub the wings off. Mm -hmm. oh, that's the one. meat? That. Yes, that's it. Get rid of the ash and things. Okay, Michelle, this one's all yours. <laughs> do you think? <laughs> you ready? I'll thank you after. I'm going to do it. No, I'll have to wait till I do wings. Go ahead. Ready? Do it, and you can tell me. There you go. <laughs> Tasty. <laughs> Great. That yeah, doesn't really taste that bad. It tastes pretty good. Really, it does. <laughs> does it remind you of anything? Yeah. Of, uh, I don't know, ow. Charcoal. <laughs> I'm eating a charcoal briquette, actually. <laughs> no, they're, they're really very good. Oh, very nice. See, I told you. Mm. We got my cooks. Come on, <laughs> Michelle. It's your turn. Come Eat on. <laughs> well, I got them, but. I'm the hunter. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> oh, okay, eat is... it. <laughs> Pop Just it close in. your eyes and eat it. <laughs> oh, it's very <laughs> chewy. Down it doesn't it goes. Taste bad, does it? Tastes like nuts or walnuts or something. Mm. Wait, it's not in my tooth. <laughs> 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 you should eat one now, Aborigine star, which is the whole thing, none of this taking off the wings first. What, yeah. if, what, if, what if you eat one Aborigine star? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Why not? Oh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is good? incredible. Crunchy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was Goodness, good. Yeah, we'll find you another one. Oh, here's a good one. This is a good one. Give me that. Eating bogong moths is a fun snack to us, but to the Aborigines, these moths were an important source of food. In fact, 
the early European settlers made sauce from bogong moths. Food that's easy to catch, plentiful, and good for you. This is a dung beetle. It eats dung. What's dung? Well, let's just say that dung's what's left on the ground after a cow walks by. It's what cow pads are made of. And if you consider that there are over 30 million cows in Australia, and each one drops about 10 to 12 cow pads a day, that's an awful lot of dung. That's why this little animal is so important, because its diet consists entirely of dung. And a whole bunch of these Dung beetles can eat a cow pad in just about three or four days. So, so without you, little fella, I'd sure be standing in an awful lot of dung. This is a cow. This is cow dung. In Australia, there are over 30 million cows. Each cow produces about 52 pounds of dung a day. That's a lot of dung. And you've got to get rid of it. Usually insects get rid of the dung by eating it. But insects that eat cow dung never evolved here because cows are not native to Australia. And that's a problem. The solution is to bring to Australia an insect that will eat cow dung. Why did we come out to this pasture today? Well, we've come out to look at cattle dung today, and this is a cattle pasture, so that's where we'll find the dung. <laughs> Lots of fun all the flies out here too, don't you? Yes, yeah. that's very true. <laughs> In fact, uh, Michelle and I are with Penny Edwards, an entomologist who's been bringing to Australia insects that eat cow dung. Yeah. Oh, here's a nice fresh one. Oh. You can to tell it's fresh. Well, you can see the flies are attracted to it. And also, it's still quite soft. There's no crust formed on it. But well, why is dung such a problem here in Australia? Well, in Australia, we don't have enough dung beetles to bury the cattle dung. We do, in fact, have some native dung beetles, but they're not very keen on utilising cattle dung. How many of these um, cattle dung would a normal cattle drop? Well, each animal drops about 12 pads a day. And in Australia, we've got about 30 million cattle. So Whoa. It's like, what, 360 million dung pads a day? Yes. <laughs> well. <laughs> why, why, aren't your dung, uh, why aren't your dung beetles able to break down the, the cow dung? Well, the native Australian dung beetles are adapted to marsupial dung, and marsupials produce dry pellets. And they're and, much smaller. Yes, and so they're, in general, not interested in these larger, moister dung pads. So how did, how did you, you know, how do you, why do you have, how do you have dung beetles now? Yeah, if the native ones haven't evolved to 
to eat this dung. Right, well we've introduced a lot of species from Africa and Europe because they have large herbivorous animals there that produce dung similar to cattle. There's buffalo and wildebeest and elephant, rhinoceros. Did you have to bring those, those bugs back with you here? Yes, we've um, brought about 50 species back from Africa mm -hmm. and 25 or 30 of those have now become established in Australia. And they're breaking down yeah. dung. Why is it so important to uh, break down the dung? Well, if the dung isn't removed or buried, it will just sit like this in a pasture for several months, maybe even a year. Are there any dung beetles in this right now? No, I don't think so. I think this one's probably a bit fresh. Many dung beetles don't fly until night, so they'll probably find this pad tonight. But we can go and find some other dung where the beetles will be active and have a look at those. Great. We'll go over here where we've got some experiments set up and have a look what's happening there. Oh, it's everywhere. Well, there's a big one over there. Cow dung must be removed from the fields for two reasons. Flies breed in the dung, and the dung covers up the grass the cows need to eat. Right, now this is an experimental site here where we've put out two dung pads. One has been covered by this excluder to keep all the dung beetles out, and this one has been left exposed to dung beetles. Mm. So if we take the top off this one, you can see there's quite a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one just looks like an empty shell. Mm. Yes, this one, there's just a crust on top and dry shreds underneath. How long uh, did that process take for, uh, for the, you know, the dung to be destroyed? Well, these pads were put out seven days ago. So this pad is still solid dung. And that one's 95% gone. Uh, that's just, that oh. proves the dung beetles are very effective then. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you get good colonization like that, it's very effective. These are two cow pads. The pad on the left is being colonized by beetles. The pad on the right is not. When we speed up the film, we can see in a few seconds what took the beetles 24 hours to accomplish. They are carrying away the dung until the pad is completely gone. How do they colonize? How do they make their nests? Well, they're attracted by the smell of the dung and they fly to the dung pad. They fly? Oh. Yes, yes, they're quite strong flyers, actually. <laughs> I don't think they flew. <laughs> yes, they do. And so they make their nests and then? Well, there's two ways of dealing with the dung. Some beetles roll the dung away, make a ball and roll it away. <laughs> but the majority actually bury the dung down under the pad. And that, and that fertilizes and they, the soil. Yes. You see the tunnels here. That's where they've made the tunnels and taken the dung down to make their nests. So the nest is actually underneath this plot? Yes. Now we can dig down and have a look at the nests if you like. That'd be great, yes. That's maybe. what we brought the big shovel for. Right, maybe David would <laughs> like to dig. <laughs> I didn't know I was here for a reason. <laughs> David, David. Here, take this for a minute. See how I go. <laughs> I'm not shoving this, it's all yours. <laughs> cool, you want it done like this, right? Yeah, keep going there, Michelle. Yeah. Doing a, Why are you worried? Doing a fine job. <laughs> just straighten up the edges. Yes, just dig down there. Okay. Oh, she don't want any help on this? Whoop, whoop, look, right there, it's a beetle. Yeah. Look how big it is. Right on top, see it? Oh, yes, look. Wow. <laughs> Well, it's green. Yes, that's one of the larger yeah. species. Really? That's incredible. And they, that's all that they have in their diet is dung. They yes. live on the dung. Yes, that's right. The adult beetle feeds on the dung juice, and then the larva that hatches from the egg feeds only on the dung. There are There's some... a little one over there. Oh, yes. Okay, we found the beetle, so we must be getting close to the nests. Michelle, would you like to hold them? Do they bite? No, dung beetles don't bite, they just suck the juice out of the dung. So oh. they haven't got biting mouth parts. Whoa, there goes one. <laughs> one just flew off on me. Okay, well, let's see if we can find the nest. And here's part of it. See, here's the dung. Oh. So the nest is made out of dung? Right, yes, they take the dung down 
for the eggs. That's all the nest is, the dung in the... Here we are. I think we should be able to lift it out now. Right. Oh, That's big. Look at that. Right, now, this is all dung, which the <coughs> adult dung beetles has made into sausages. Can you see the three sausage shapes there? Yeah. Look at that. Well, they've, they've made a tunnel, filled it with dung, and then within each sausage they have laid two eggs. How can you tell that there's two? The raised point indicates where there's an egg in each sausage. There's usually two in each sausage. So if we break off one sausage, and then we look in the end, And there's the egg. Jeez, it's really See? Wow. If you want the eggs to hatch, do you have to rebury them? Yes, for the larvae to survive, we have to rebury the nest. Otherwise, the dung would dry out too quickly. So let's rebury it. The kind of beetle we just saw carries away the dung, buries it, then lays eggs in it. Here is another kind of dung beetle. This kind breaks up the pad by rolling it into many balls. The beetle rolls the ball away. Later, it lays eggs in the ball. After the eggs have been laid, the beetle buries the ball. This kind of beetle is known as the ball-rolling dung beetle. The dung beetle, an animal that lives completely on dung. I can't understand how it could possibly live without pizza. Three Two One Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. For a copy of a comprehensive Three Two One Contact Teacher's Guide, send a check for five dollars to Children's Television Workshop. Three Two One Contact. Box TG, 1 Lincoln Plaza, New York, New York, 10023.